This week, I focus on an amazing source of perfect ghost stories, ghost hunters, my own experience in the field, and two wonderful ghost stories starting right now. The following story was reported by Josiah Hess of Vice.com. It's November of 2014. A visitor to a haunt in Iowa called the Villisca Axe Murder House was rushed to a nearby hospital. The wound? Self-inflicted stabbing. The reason? This is where it gets strange. The house is a familiar site for paranormal investigators, said to be one of the most haunted places in America. Dark history thrusting it into the limelight in 1912, when six children and two adults were found dead in their beds, all their skulls crushed by an axe. The murderer was never found. It's a horrific, unsolved crime, the start of any infamous haunted house. Now, currently owned by a woman named Martha, the 77-year-old purchased the house in 1994, lovingly restoring it to its 1912 form, committed to the history by taking out all the plumbing and electricity. Quote, I have notebooks from the last two years, overnight experiences. Few go away without experiencing something, Martha has said. Now has become one of the most regularly visited sites for ghost hunters who will often bring Ouija boards, audio recorders. One even brought an axe to stir stuff up. What are they stirring up? It all happened on the night of June 9th in 1912. Josiah Moore and his wife, three sons, one daughter, they all attended an evening church service before returning home. Two friends of the daughter were invited to spend the night. At 7 a.m. the following morning, a neighbor noticed the house was quiet. She found the doors locked and all the windows were covered. Calling Moore's brother for help, they'd find the family in their beds. Local officials lost control of the crime scene. About a hundred people gathered on the scene as each body was brought out. There was no forensics of the day. It didn't help to have the onlookers destroying evidence. They did, however, find axe marks on the bedroom ceilings, revealing the killer's height as being quite tall. Much suspicion and finger pointing divided the town. Today, historians talk about three possibilities. A serial killer with ties to similar murders. A traveling preacher with a history of sexual misconduct or a state senator who thought to have hired a coke-addled hitman to kill more. No one was ever convicted. Fast forward. Robert Larson Jr. knew these stories when visiting a few years back. The 37-year-old from Wisconsin arrived with a group of friends for what was later called a recreational paranormal investigation. The county sheriff said, quote, he was alone in the northwest bedroom, and the rest of the party was outside. He yelled for help on their mobile two-way radios. Now they found Robert stabbed in the chest, called 911, rushing their friend to the hospital for help. A mystery began. The police didn't help at all. When released, the official report showed a time of the occurrence was 12.45 a.m., this is interesting because it is said to be the time of night that Josiah, his wife Sarah Moore, along with their four children and two visiting friends were, were brutally murdered in the house. A police report the townsfolk wish was never released. Local Sheriff Sampson says he never been called out to the house for emergencies in the past. Said, Villisca is your basic small town Iowa farming community. A lot of unwanted attention happened after the Larson episode, saying they've all been inundated with media inquiries. Quote, this particular incident is very upsetting, a local caretaker says. It's publicity, but not exactly the kind of publicity you want. I don't want people thinking 
when they come to Velisca, the axe murderer house, something's going to happen that's going to make them do something like that. I want them to have a good experience. Now the update on Larson. He recovered fine from his injuries, but he has refused to comment. He says that he does this out of respect for the family. Now, I used to be a paranormal investigator. This is going back a time. I'd say starting when I kind of got into the paranormal back in 1999. And um, my original experience was as an investigator so i'm not going to go into the detail story i've talked about it before at nauseum but it was related to a house here in my own city of hamilton very haunted place uh, some called it canada's amityville house i'm not sure that's uh, warranted but uh, writing about it and investigating it really amateur investigation at that I, I came out of it with that experience and I knew this was something that I would really love I didn't know exactly how I would fall in love with it but that I would actually enjoy being in the paranormal so it all starts with residential homes now if you are a paranormal investigator listening right now you're getting into the field and you're not sure how to begin. Most people do start with residential homes. Now, this is something you have to be careful today. It wasn't as uh, strict back in the day. Uh, you know, you got to you got to do the waivers now. You got to um, get, you know, written consent and uh, be very careful when you're inside somebody's home. I, I always tell people, you know, start with folks, you know, start with friends, start with family, um, people you're connected with that you can trust and get your experience through that, get your material through that, um, you know, your stories, your evidence, the things that will get you to become more popular. And once you become more popular, that's when more opportunities will come your way. So it all begins with residential homes. That's how it was with me as well. You know, you'd get um, a message in, uh, we had a website, so you get a message in, and they'd be like, oh, I think my my house is haunted. I need somebody to come out, look into it, maybe give me some advice. And in some cases where the haunting was a little out of control, where the spirit was restless, for example, they would also request to um, have a clearing. Now, as a side, for psychics, I knew that this was kind of a touchy subject, that they would rather not do a clearing than in a way it's kind of considered immoral in the psychic community. So I've heard. I am not a psychic. I do not claim to be an expert in this field. But that if the spirit is restless, meaning it is causing damage, it is causing danger to the owners of the house, then in that case, you might have a warranted clearing, which is something that a psychic could attempt not going to say it's going to work. Some spirits can be very stubborn. But going into these residential homes and doing the investigations, I actually received my belief in the paranormal doing this because one of the reasons because is that these folks were very regular people. So you would have some folks that when you meet them, you know they're huge believers in the paranormal, and I love that. But sometimes it's to the point where even the stuff that has natural solutions, natural explanations, that they uh, dismiss that, that it has to be a ghost. So you can be on the, the too far side of believing. You could be on the too far side of skepticism. It goes both ways. But a lot of the folks that we were doing investigations that we would accept the investigation for, uh, they were very normal folks, just normal families. They in a way, weren't really in the paranormal. They didn't know what was going on. They knew it was something ghostly, and they needed folks like us, who were the, uh, I quote, experts in the field at the beginning, not so much. That They needed us to come in and, and, and look into the situation, maybe dive a bit into the history, maybe explain who was haunting the place to see if it's something that they were okay with living with. In most cases, if the spirit wasn't restless, they were okay with living with it. 
because non-restless spirits are usually quite nice. They, um, you ask them not to scare you and they'll not do that. They'll just kind of stay in the background. I don't know if they're still watching you. If you feel like you're being watched, they're probably watching you. <laughs> Sorry. I hope you're not listening to this at night. But that was my kind of experience in the paranormal. It went from residential homes into some businesses, um, you know, more known haunted places, uh, and just kind of like gave me that foot in the door and gave me that experience. And I could then fall into what I truly love to do. And one thing I realized was I did not, did not uh, love being a paranormal investigator. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making a very generalized uh, statement there. I did not love the investigation side of it. I didn't really have the patience for it. If there's one thing that I am known for is the fact that I can get easily bored. This is this is just me. So sitting there watching the equipment, uh, waiting for something to happen. Sometimes these investigations can go uh, days, multiple visits, hours at a time just sitting there waiting for stuff. It just wasn't me. Now, I know you're, you might be screaming at the uh, the podcast right now and saying, but Daniel, I see ghost hunters on TV and ghost adventurers, and they, you know, they go and do these investigations. Things happen right away, and pictures get dragged across tables and stuff like that. But for the most part, that stuff is faked. I'm sure you've heard this said before. I'm sure you don't like it if you love those shows, and I completely understand. I can see the ghost show now. The more popular ones are going into more storytelling, which for me, that's that's perfect. You know, I love those stories. But back in the day when they actually did the investigations, like Hunters and Adventurers, that they couldn't really guarantee stuff would happen. If stuff didn't happen, the ratings went down. So it was kind of a catch-22. You get stuck in this little bit of a trap where you had to entertain people, but you couldn't guarantee that the ghosts were going to perform. I know it's a terrible word. Uh, but that's how they had to go with it. So the only way that they could fix this was something that they called dramatizations. Now, they didn't tell you this, You'd be watching the show and thinking that that stuff's occurring. But behind the scenes, most of them, I can't say all, but most of them were dramatizations. I actually worked with a show that will remain nameless that admitted this to me. Like, we, we weren't there as the investigators. We weren't there when the actual stuff occurred. Or if something happened, usually it would be set up by the producers. Like if somebody, uh, the team is standing in a dark room and you hear a scream in the distance. It was usually set up by the producers. So the talent, the uh, investigators had no idea that it was faked. So that they would have legitimate reactions to it. And the dramatizations for us in this one show was that something occurred. It was in a hotel and a, a towel uh, was found on a bed and wasn't there before. Uh, something had occurred, and it was it was basically faked for the camera, but it was based on a true experience from the past. So there's the there's the rub right there. So technically, it's not lying. In that case, you know, the show was showing a legit experience, but they couldn't like it didn't happen on camera, so they had to create it for the camera. This is the dramatization. So the, the, the investigative shows, like what I'm talking about now, really doesn't matter now. As I mentioned, it's going more into the storytelling, which, again, that's my bag, baby. Seriously. <laughs> Sorry about that. I, I love hearing and telling stories. And I realized this when becoming an investigator that all of the uh, evidence stuff wasn't really that exciting for me personally, that people would be sharing their stories as we were going through the houses and businesses and I was like, wow, I was like, I'm loving this. I, I don't really care that the EMF detector spiked. I care more about what this person's telling me, this look on their face, what they went through and experienced. It just was awesome. So I started taking those stories in and I would report them out. And that was my thing. So for all of the investigations, I would be the one to share the story. It was, you know, kind of my thing for even when I was a child, I was, I was a writer, you know, I, I loved, I was reading Stephen King when I was nine, 10 years old. Uh, thanks, mom and dad. 
and uh and I, I loved writing telling short stories and whatnot of course this isn't the type of career that you should pursue in this world we live in today i did not want to be a starving artist so i went a different angle to make money but i've always come back to my real passion and that um it always sits in the background you know i don't know if you understand if you if you've had this experience in your life you might understand that if there's a true love in this world that you enjoy a passion that you enjoy for something that you were born for i believe all of us are born for something that we have an advantage at something and for me it was that so even though i was working in computers for many years the siren song of the <laughs> of, of the writer and storyteller was was singing in the distance and it would kept pulling me that kept pulling me back in. So, you know, a decade in computers, I actually was climbing the corporate ladder. I was a network administrator when I decided to leave the field and focus my efforts on uh, the ghost walks. So that's what kind of pushed me into that. And the ghost walks were a great way to tell stories. So I have and still had and still have a real passion for strange and odd history and of course amazing ghost stories uh, this is my thing and here is one of those ghost stories during one of the ghost hunts at the custom house here in the city of hamilton i remember being in the gallery doing a story exchange with about 20 people was very enjoyable sitting with the group, hearing the stories from regular folks, many of who weren't uh, fully believers. Always amazed me how everyone seemed to have a ghost story in their life, but they could tell this most grand tale and in the next breath say, but I'm not sure if I believe. I'd like to think that the custom house brought this out in them. It was almost a guarantee that something strange was going to happen to the group when doing hunts in the building. That night's group knew this, sitting in the room, unaware of what was happening to a couple of volunteers sitting in the third floor attic. Lauren and Marion were up there, attempting communication with a Ouija board. Yes, this was a mainstay at the hunts. I'm personally a fan of the board. It's one of the reasons I'm in the paranormal today. Now I have a strange obsession with it, calling it the dreaded divination tool, which I believe is an unfair assessment. But it is effective, as Lauren and Marion learned, sitting in the attic, fully aware of the resident ghost of the space. We called him the caretaker, a man who lived in the attic during the time when the building was Naples Macaroni. Long before automated security systems, he lived in a small apartment that was abetted in the back corner. The ladies sat outside of that space, close to the dark lady's mantelpiece, and of course the only exit, just in case they needed to run out. Amazing forethought. The Ouija was active that night, moving about. They connected with the caretaker, Planchet moving again. Then Marion had an idea. Any fan of the paranormal, and all experienced investigators are aware of this statement. And 99.9% .9 of the time, it's followed by silence and a tense moment that's usually broken when somebody coughs. Quote, Hey caretaker, if you're here, prove it. Marion adding her own spin, knock on the wall. The ladies sat quiet listening into the silence from any subtle noise because most experiences are only subtle a light tapping in the distance a foreign breath from a dark corner they didn't expect this to actually work marion leaned her head against the wall just as the knocking began she felt that shock the kind when someone knocks a bit too hard on your front door when you don't expect it she jumped back Flight took over and Marion ran out the exit and down the stairs. Now back in the gallery, I personally was listening to a guest's story when hearing that sound. I interrupted the guests 
and on the quiet we all heard the scream. Quiet at first in the distance, and louder as Marion entered the first level, ran by the main gallery, and straight out the front door. Lauren came down soon after, sharing the story with the group. This remains one of the few times the famous paranormal statement actually worked, a testament to the haunted custom house in Hamilton. Okay, that's it, everyone. Thanks for listening. I'll talk to you next week.